My name is Dr. Masuma Rahim. I'm a clinical psychologist living in London and I work for the National Health Service. I believe in the principles of freedom, tolerance and liberalism. Well, I wouldn't consider myself um, a human rights defender in the grand sense of the word. You know, I'm not involved uh, in human rights at any uh, particular higher level. But I suppose I would consider myself someone on the side of people who are victimized, who are dispossessed, on the side of minorities. Uh, and that is partly a result uh, of the work I do. As I say, I'm a psychologist, and many of the people I see are people who are marginalized in society, people who may be from minority groups or people who may have experienced deprivation or trauma. And although my day-to-day -day work involves working with those people individually to help them resolve those difficulties, more and more I think that the more important work is to tackle the root causes. So to tackle institutionalized and culturally acceptable discrimination, for example, to think about the impact of trauma and conflict on well-being and mental health. And so I suppose I find myself thinking more about systemic factors in well-being than thinking about traditional individual psychological therapy. You know, I've worked in psychology and mental health for almost 10 years. And for much of that time, the work I have done has been individual work, you know, work which is mainly one-on-one -on -one, or perhaps with families. But we have huge amounts of evidence which tells us that there are societal uh, that there's a societal impact on people. So we know, for example, that in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, uh, austerity has been very, very bad for people's mental health. And I see people in my clinical practice who might be referred because they are depressed. But when you conduct the assessment, you find out that one member of the family has lost their job, for example, or that the family's benefits have been cut and they can't afford to live, or they're living in unsuitable accommodation because there is not enough housing in London, uh, or you discover that they're living in an area of great deprivation or high crime. And actually, it's very difficult as a psychologist to help someone to overcome low mood when the environment in which they are living contribute to their difficulties. And as I said, for an awfully long time, psychologists, including myself, have worked far too much on the individual factors. And I don't think we have done enough to challenge systemic violence and socio-cultural factors which contribute to you know, poor well-being. I think I think it is obvious. I think it's I think it's common sense. You know, if you think of someone who is born into uh, a deprived household in which there isn't enough food, or there isn't enough money to keep the house warm, or where they might be abused, or where their parents might use substances, or where the schools in the local area uh, are not terribly good. And there are very few opportunities to get qualifications or to train or take an apprenticeship. It makes sense that someone who lives that kind of life might have difficulty coping when they get older. It makes sense that they might 
that they might be depressed, for example, or that they might have difficulty coping with emotions and that they might use alcohol or drugs as a way to help them cope with very, very difficult and traumatic experiences. That all makes sense. We have huge amounts of data which show that if you put people in situations in which they experience uh, repeated multiple traumas, be it abuse, bullying, poverty, uh, having to care for parents with uh, physical or psychological health problems, people who go through those things often end up having a very tough time of it and they are much more likely to present to mental health services. We know that migrants are much more likely to present to mental health services. We know that people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans are much more likely to self-harm, to use substances, to attempt suicide. We know all these things. I think that radicalism is a, a very complex issue and I think there are many factors. So we know that communities which are ghettoized, in which there is poor integration uh, and in which there may be poverty, uh, we, we know those factors are implicated, for example. Uh, but we also know that if a community is vilified and demonized, what it will do, what all communities do in that situation, what all systems do, is they huddle together, they try to maintain their safety by sticking with who and what they know. And that's a very human response. When under attack, you retreat to a safe space. The problem with that is that retreating to a safe space makes those systems, those communities vulnerable to people with great charisma and uh, with a, a will to manipulate and brainwash them. And I think we see a lot of that. We see, we see radicalization in communities which haven't been integrated very well into mainstream society. Uh, and that does leave the potential for someone with uh, a big personality to come and proclaim themselves some kind of leader and and uh, unite these perhaps disenfranchised people against what might be considered a wider enemy. It used to be the case that uh, colleagues would ask me, or people who didn't know me very well would ask me, but I think that the appalling atrocities that have occurred in the last couple of years, uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, the murder of Lee Rigby in Woolwich, for example, and of course Paris. I think those things are so awful uh, that even people who don't know me very well uh, wouldn't dream of asking if I was uh, in any way in sympathy with the perpetrators. And so that's a subtle shift. But I think now, because there is such a strong media discourse which suggests that Muslims or immigrants are dangerous or to be feared, I think that's become a lot more pervasive. So there are fewer questions being asked of Muslims and perhaps more assumptions being made. And those assumptions, I think, can be deeply, deeply dangerous. I think some self-awareness is key for all of us, really. Because, you know, every day we are bombarded with, uh, with messages via television and newspapers and the internet. And it's really easy for all of us to absorb that and for our views and our perceptions to be changed quite radically, almost without us realizing it. And so I think for all of us, uh, some healthy skepticism uh, and some real thought and discussion about what media 
sources and politicians are telling us is very, very important. Because if you think about what you have heard and you discuss it and you deliberate it, your opinions are likely to be much more well-founded. I think it's when that rational thought stops and we simply become sponges absorbing what we're told that hateful ideas and ideas which divide can really take root. Thank you.